You guys know that, right? Awesome. Hey, uh, we got a lot of work to do today, and I uh, just want to let you know I'm not going to be short, so why don't you go ahead and open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. All right, Acts chapter 20, and uh, our gold mine this morning will be verses 28 through 38. All right, so um, while, we're, uh, while we're getting there, I just want to tell you that I think, uh, I think I speak for all preachers. I think that all preachers, uh, in an effort... Uh, to preach a good message, we all want to preach a good message, an effective message. Uh, we don't always want to be right and hold our own thoughts as truth, but we want to be effective, right? We want to be effective communicators of God's Word. But in an effort to make a good message, often, uh, you know, we, we're, we're looking for the secret, right? We're, we're, look, we're digging into the text uh, to find the secret, the, the hidden message of heavenly revelation, Right? That, that everybody else in the seats might not see because, you know, we're the preachers and, and you're not. And, we, 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 you know, you come because we want to dig out something, some new heavenly revelation that you haven't seen. And so you come to church to hear all that. And sometimes there, there is some hidden gems in, in the Holy Spirit reveals those things to you as you're reading um, and meditating on those, uh, on those things. Th- those nuggets are awesome. They are awesome. Um, but too often, uh, just the, the simple, uh, raw reading of the text, the, just reading the plain message of the author um, that he was trying to relay uh, to the people, to, to his immediate audience then, uh, sometimes those things are overlooked in an effort to find the revelation, right? And uh, I think that's a massive mistake, Okay. I just want to say that that's a massive mistake, and so it would be with our text today. See, see what, what oftentimes I think gets neglected is, is when you pick up your Bible, you know, you pick up your Bible to see what God has to say to you, and I think that's really good, but you, you, never, have to for, you never can forget this, that when, 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 the, when the author of Scripture was writing this, right, he had no idea that in 2020 that we would be sitting here reading it. He had no idea, right? You know what he thought? Hey, here's a certain group of people in a certain setting, in a certain city, right, at a certain time with a certain problem. And and so the author would address that problem, okay? And and then that's the way you need to look at the text all the time. And then from that, then you can glean, okay, so then what would that mean for us today? But, But always remember that the text is written to those people at that time, okay? And so we need to do that right now, okay? So in Acts chapter 20, we're going to read 28 to 38, but just to kind of you know, catch you up if you weren't here last week. So what happens is uh, Paul's out and about, and, he's, and he's, he's passionate about bringing the kingdom uh, of God to these different cities. He understands the urgency. Uh, you know, remember last week, every 12 seconds, Somebody dies every 12 seconds in this country, right? Every 12 seconds, someone dies. And, and how many of those people will pass into a Christless eternity into a real place called hell where there's torment and gnashing of teeth? Every 12 seconds. And Paul understood this urgency. And so island to island, city to city, not there to make buddies with you, right? To tell you the truth. I never back down from telling you what you needed to hear. What was his one message to Jew and Gentile alike? Repent of your sin, turn to God, embrace Christ by faith. That's the message, right? Did you hear it? Okay, awesome. Now it's on you, and I go to the next city, right? He's not there playing, you know, Uno with you and, and, and going to ball games and picnics and so that somehow, some way, you'll befriend him, and then maybe two years down the line, I've earned the right to speak into your life. Meanwhile, that dude gets whacked by a bus, and you never had the chance to talk to him. Open your mouth. And Paul understood this urgency, and I hope that it compels you to do the same. And so he says, I never back down. I never, ever cease from telling you what you needed to hear. The gospel, the gospel, okay, that's what he did. And our message needs to be the message of the gospel, that you're a sinner, and Jesus isn't, and he is perfect, and he is God, and he came down from heaven, and he left his throne to come down and seek and save that which was lost. And he went to the cross to pay for your sin and mine, in full. And if you embrace what he did on the cross and make him the Lord and Savior of your life, you have heaven forever. That's the gospel, okay? 
And every time you get together with someone, they, you know what? You could tell them a lot of things. You could teach them how to be a good steward of your money. You could teach them how to be a good parent. That's all awesome. You should do it. At the end of the day, they need to hear what I just said to you or else they're going to pass into a Christless eternity. And heaven help that we let people on our watch pass into death and darkness when all the while you had the antidote to their problem. It can't happen anymore, okay? Open your mouths, and that's where we are. So Acts 20, you ready? Are you? Verse 28. He's going around, he's telling everybody, right? He says, hey, if you, if you die and you go to hell, it ain't my fault. You know why? Because I told you. I told you the truth. So he's, now here we are, verse 28. So guard yourselves and God's people. Feed and shepherd God's flock, his church, purchased with his own blood, over which the Holy Spirit has appointed you as elders. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. Watch out! Remember the three years I was with you? My constant watch and care over you night and day and my many tears for you. And now I, I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. I have never coveted anyone's silver or gold or fine clothes. You know that these hands of mine have worked to supply my own needs and even the needs of those who were with me. And I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And he said this, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Man, the world needs to hear that. Drop the mic, right? Let that soak in for a second. It's more blessed to give than to receive. When he had finished speaking, he knelt and he prayed with them. They all cried as they embraced and kissed him goodbye. They were sad most of all because he had said that they would never see him again. Then they escorted him down to the ship. Okay, so that's our reading. Now, if you've studied the book of Acts at all, if you've been with us now for almost a year, you've studied this. What I'm about to say to you is that, in that Acts 18 and 19 is the birth of the church at Ephesus. That, that's when it all went down, okay? And it describes what happened there. And Paul and, and those guys were, were sharing the gospel with people. And, of course, the people that were there, there's this temple of Artemis and all this controversy because Paul and the boys are going into town sharing their faith, sharing the gospel with people. People are getting saved like crazy, right? And so the people who are making these little false god statues and stuff, they're, they're out of work. That nobody, it, the, the gospel impacted the city so much that it changed uh, the, the marketplace. That has to happen here, man. Right? The, the gospel changed Ephesus, where, where the people who, in charge there were saying, these guys are ruining everything. Let it be said of Revolution Church, Amen. that these people ruined everything, everything wicked and ugly and vile, gone because the gospel's here, right? Good and light and love. That's what should prevail. And so in Acts 18 and 19, the church begins... In Ephesus, and as we see in our text in verse, what, 31, it says, I, I, remember the three years I was with you, my constant watch over you, day and night, many tears. We, we see in the birth of the church at Ephesus what really went down there. He, he, he went to the town, and immediately he went to the house of worship and started sharing the gospel with people. And people liked that. Some people liked it, some people don't. That's like that in every church, I get it. And, and when the people, um, when most of them were like, yeah, I don't like this message, right? Because the gospel will do that to you, won't it? Hey, you got no control, right? You're not as cool as you think you are, right? You're nothing, right? You need me. That's not what everybody wants to hear, right? So, so, so Paul kind of says, you know what? If you don't want to hear the truth, I'm out of here. And I've had those days, right? Haven't we all had those days? I'm out of here, right? And so he actually, does, he does not, he's not a man who, who, who lies, right? Paul said, I'm, no, I'm out of here. And he took his group, and he took the people who want to hear it, and he went to this place called the Lecture Hall of Tyrannus. This, this, let's just think municipal building. Just like the, the county, um, I don't know, like a, like, a, like a rec center, right? Downtown Leesburg or something. And he said, you know, I'm just going to preach here. And anyone who wants to hear the good news, you hear it, I'll tell it, you hear it. So he goes, and he was there, listen, 
Every day he preached. Hundreds of days in a row, he goes and he preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Every single day. So much so, the scripture said, that because of what he did, that one dude in that one place, that every person in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. Awesome, right? What would happen if everyone in Lake County got to go to church one day? Just, just, just let's, Can we just dream together for a second? <laughs> Let's just dream for a second. What would happen, there's about 350,000 people in this county. What would happen if on one unbelievable Holy Spirit-led day, he dragged everyone into a church and every single person in this county today heard the gospel? What would that do to the city of Leesburg? Let that sink in, y'all. There's a slide up there on the thing before you get in the room. It says, let's all do our part. Invite someone. You all want to see that happen, right? Do your part. Do your part. Don't come here next week alone, right? I'm not saying if you don't have anyone, don't come. Like, I already throw people out of here. Like, remember last week? I'm still trying to figure that one out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Get out, right? Just get out of here. Nobody... I watched it. I try to watch it every week after I get done. I try to watch the sermon to make sure I didn't say any like crazy blasphemous statement because sometimes my mouth just gets ahead of me, right? And I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh heavens, did I just do that? <laughs> get out. <laughs> get out. But uh, I have faithful friends who love Jesus enough to come back the next day and say, it's cool. I got out of here and I shared the gospel with three people. So, like, it was good, right? It was good. It was good. Paul didn't call it foolish preaching for nothing. He had me in mind, I think. He was faithful every single day. He pastored these people. Paul's known for, a, for, for being the evangelist, the church planter, right? The guy who goes around, he plants different church after church after church. And he did do that. But in this case, he was actually there with them for three years. He was there. That's a long time. And he was faithful, constant, day and night, right? This is what an elder, this is what an overseer, a, a, a bishop, a pastor, this is the job of the pastor. Every single day, always thinking about you, always praying for you, always taking your phone calls, going to see you. It's just, that's the way it is, right? It's not for the, for the weak. This is just something that's, that takes a lot. He faithfully preached God's word every single day to all the people for three years in the synagogue, in the lecture hall, in their homes. He said, I never backed off from telling you what you needed to hear, both in public and in your homes. He was relentless, this guy, right? It was a consistent message. His one message, we said it. Repent of your sin, turn to God, have trust, have faith in Jesus. That was his message. Every single day, three years, no matter who was there in front of him, he preached that all the time. A consistent message from a consistent messenger. That's Paul. And that's the, that's the, that's the mark of a true leader in your church. That's the way they need to be all the time. Okay, But now we see that Paul has moved on. We see that Paul has moved on. And, it's, and, and some people are meant to stay. And some people are meant to go. But all people are meant to serve and build in whatever capacity, in whatever location you're in. You understand? Like you see it in, in Acts chapter 13. I used to think, man, if God brought you here to this church, you're here for life. Sign up. Where's your blood? That's a good, that's a nice thing. You want that to happen. You know how many people have come and gone? If you've been at this church for a long time, you know the people who have come and gone from this place. And, and precious, precious men and women that, that Meredith and I love. And when they left, man, it rips your guts out. Because you just want it to happen here, man. The, 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 the gifting pool, the talent that has been in this church since it started, it's insane what God has brought to this place. And they have one after another, left, 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 left. And I get it, and I hate it, but it is true. Some are meant to stay. Some are meant to leave. Acts chapter 13, Paul and Barnabas are there in the synagogue, right? And they're there. They're there. And I'm sure the people that were there were loving that. Like, hey, the, these guys are here. Like, not just like, it's not, it's not Karen and Dawn. I love them. But no, it's Paul, right? It's Paul. And, and, so, and what happens? 
The Holy Spirit tells the leaders of the church, yeah, lay your hands on them, they're leaving. Go commission those guys. Right? Can't you take the complainer in the back row? Why do you got to take, you know, Herb, right, and, and me? Why, why do you got to take the, the elders of the church? Why, right? I get it. But that's what happened. They laid their hands on them because the Holy Spirit said, commission them. They're going to go plant churches for me. And so they had to leave. Some people are meant to stay. Some people are meant to go. And so we see in our text that Paul is giving the church a warning. Uh, he's about to leave. And he's given them a warning that, that, that there's going to be a little bit of an invasion there. And he's also uh, issuing at the same time this massive value statement uh, to that church. And it can be gleaned from it that he's saying the same thing to us. And here, here's, how he, here's, here's how he says, this is his value statement. How much you'll spend on something determines its value in your eyes. Do you agree? So if you went to a, a store and there was a stick of Trident gum and it said $100 on it, who would pay for that? No, not at all, right? Because you look at it and you go, this is not valuable enough to me to give up my 100 bucks, right? So the more valuable you think it is, the more you're going to spend on it and so what does the scripture say that God spent on the church at Ephesus? His blood. His blood. That's how much he paid. You can't spend more than that, can you? Right? You can, you can give up all your, we could pass the, the plate around, you could give up your, your, your money, and you could give up your home, and you could give up your cars, and you can give up all your stuff, that's all fine and good. But at the end of the day, when all that's gone, what do you have left to give? You. That's the, that's the most valuable thing, right? You could, you could say, here, take my stuff. That's, like, really awesome. If somebody was, went up to, and you don't have to do it here, but you go up to some in secret, don't let your left hand know what the right's doing, go up to some Christian ministry that's, that's really aggressively campaigning for the kingdom across the earth and give them all of your money. That's awesome, right? It is. I think that's great. But Paul says to give your bodies as a living sacrifice. That that's your reasonable worship, right? Keep your money, y'all. Give me you. But listen, God knows if he, if he gets you, he gets your money. <laughs> right? He knows if he gets you, he gets your time. He knows if he gets you, he gets your prayer. He knows if he gets you, you'll be a greeter. You'll sing in the band. You'll do whatever it is that you need to do to serve him. But first he needs, first and foremost, what does he need? He wants you, right? He wants you. And so how important is this church at Ephesus to God? That he would give his own life to purchase it from the kingdom of darkness and to deliver all these people from the full wrath of God upon the sinner. And bring them, like Scripture says, it bring, and brings them into His presence, holy, blameless, and without a single fault. That's what He's done with His blood. And this is the same payment that bought Revolution Church. All of you, right here. It's that same payment that brought you into the kingdom and brought you into this place together as a family. And so how do you view, I, I started thinking about this, how, how do the people, how do I, and how do you view Revolution Church? I know that most people in this country view their church like there's the crazy, radical, all in on Jesus, guys and gals. I get it. But most people in this world, in this country, view their church as one of the things that they do. And, and, and most often it's one of the, th I'd like to say it's what you do on Sunday. But the truth is you probably don't go every Sunday. What, how do you view Revolution Church, the church that God brought you to? And I'm not talking about the, the Holy Spirit saying to Herb and I that Karen needs to go and Donald needs to go and we lay our hands on you and say go, like Holy Spirit driven. I'm, that's awesome. But while you're here, how do you view Revolution Church? What's your perspective on it? When you consider serving here, when you consider giving towards the mission that God has given us, when you consider attending here, is this church important to you as it is to God who gave his blood for it? 
God thinks it's very important. And, and Paul, he got it. He, he thought it was important too. Remember, he three years, a constant watch over us. Day and night it was. Many tears. The, the plots of the people to kill him. And he relentlessly advanced the kingdom of Christ right there in Ephesus without fail. He understood that, listen, they, he didn't blow up church because he had something to do. He could have blown off church because if you go there, we're going to kill you. And what happens? He went. Relentless, right? Because he understands that God, he, he, he paid with his blood, right? You're no longer your own. You've been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, right? And, and he understood this. And, and so now Paul has moved on. But because he loves the people so much, he writes back, right? He, he, he says, hey, guys, come here. I got to talk to you. I'm, I'm leaving. Like, I left town, but I, I love you. I care for you because a, a real shepherd would. Owe. Listen, if I was to, to, to be gone from here today and God said, I want you to go there, I'd still care about you. I'd still love you, right? That's what a real pastor, he, he loves his people. Right? I get it. And Paul loved his people. And so he warns them. He didn't just say, hey, that's a nice church. And I think it seems to be going pretty good. See ya. Figure it out, right? No. It, there's a sense that the new people should, that once he's gone, they should, they should gather around, and they should make it right and make it good and make it effective and flourish and all that. But at the same time, right, you should always be looking back, calling on the phone, email, how's it going? How can I help? How can I pray? Right? All the time. And he understood that. And so he loves his people. And he understands they've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And so now Paul, he's moved on, but he warns these precious blood-bought sheep of God's flock to watch out. And what's his warning? that there's going to be people that distort the truth. It's going to be people that distort the truth. And, and, and they did it then, and they do it now. Okay? They do it now, all the time. So it's very apropos for us right now. But this is why Paul warns them. He warns them because what's going to happen is insidious. It's, it's, it's sneaky, and it's slight, right? How many people are going to walk, how many people are going to walk into this church on a Sunday morning, right? And fall for the, the, the moron atheist that gets up there and goes, yeah, God's fake. You're going to fall for that one? You're not going to fall for that one. No way, right? We could, be, we, could, we could debunk that foolishness right here, right now in this room with, with go just up and down these rows and get a, a hundred testimonies right now to the reality of God and the goodness of God right here, right now. We could, we'd throw that dude right out of Get out of here, you fool. Right? But that's not what I'm talking about, right? That's not what's happening here. No, that's not the way the devil works, right? You guys are too smart for some knucklehead to get up here and start telling you God's not real. I believe for greater things concerning you, you're not going to fall for that. It might happen somewhere else, but it's not going to happen here. You're too studied. Not studied enough. Amen? Amen. But you're studied up enough to know that God is real. You've got, you might not be a theologian. You might not have a degree on your wall, but you've had some things happen in your life. You know that God's real, right? And you could testify to those things right here, right now, and we could be here till dinner and never finish. Right, so we understand all that, but that's not what's happening here. That's not, what the, that's not what the devil really does in the church, right? Remember the garden? Just a little, you ready? Tweak, tweak. Just a little tweak, right? Not some crazy stuff. Even when, even when the devil talked to Jesus himself, it kind of sounded kind of Christian-y, didn't it? Right? But, but Jesus, he's got a good honker, right? <laughs> he knew. He could sniff that stuff out in a hurry, right? And you need to as well. That's the point of this text, right? Put on your Jewish honker. He's Jewish. He's got to, right? You got to be able to know the truth, right? You need to know the truth. He likes to take, listen, you know what the devil likes to do? He likes to take what God says and just, ready? Want to do it with me? Tweak, tweak. That's what he likes to do, right? Nothing big, nothing, nothing bold, just a little tweak, right? We hear it all the time. It's a distortion of the truth. You know what distortion means? It means a falsified reproduction of sound or video. A falsified reproduction of what you would hear or see. A distortion is just, you know, I just can't see it clearly. I can hear you what you're saying. I can see what you mean, but I'm just not getting it, right? I'll give you these warnings as your pastor who loves you. Whether you're at this church or some other, maybe you get sent, maybe the Holy Spirit's going to, Tell us before the service is over. Before I say amen, the Holy Spirit might say to us that there's someone in this church that we need to lay hands on and get them out of here. 
whether you're at this church and it's me preaching or 10 years from now it's another preacher here or you go to another church, here's a, here's a warning from your pastor, okay? Any church that you walk into and they don't say open your Bible, run. Amen. Run. You don't need to hear stories about his vacation or his puppy dog or his kids. They don't matter, okay? And, and listen, I'll give you another one too. And let, and if you're going to go to a church, go to a church that, 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 te- that teach. this is the style, biblical exposition. They open up the Bible, they get to the beginning of a book like I did in Acts and say, open to Acts chapter 1, and we go through it step by step. Listen, when you do that, right, you get context, you get all of it. You can't cherry pick little, because I could cherry pick all day long, every single week, and I can twist the scriptures Tweak, tweak, to make it fit my theology. But when you walk through books of the Bible, <laughs> oops, I thought it was this, but wham, there's verse 9. What am I going to do about that one, right? So listen, if they don't say open your Bible and they're not preaching, expository preaching, run, right? It's nice to go to a topical preacher because he's entertaining. But I saw a picture online today. A church is not a group that needs to be entertained. It's an army that needs to be empowered. That's what they need, the Word of God, right? So don't, don't go to a church that's going to cherry-pick cherry prick Scripture, okay? So Paul is telling the elders to, to look, at, and this is kind of interesting. It says to, uh, verse 28, what does he say? Uh, Guard yourselves and God's people. Now he's talking to the people who are in charge of the church, right, the leaders of the church. He says, because I'm gone, I need you to feed and shepherd God's flock. I always kind of thought that they were the same thing, right? The, 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 the pastor is the shepherd, right? And, and in a sense, it, it, he is, but, but there's, look how, look how the, the text separates the two, right? Because there's two different jobs here. Okay, I, I, I would just say that I'm not a strong shepherd. Newsflash, right? Everyone's going, really? You're not? Yeah, I'm not. You know that, right? But it's, it's, it's Pastor Jay was a shepherd. He was nice. I'm not. But pray for me. Thank you. But there's feed and then there's shepherd, right? The feed, feed, feed. What? Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep, right? That's the equipping of God's people to do God's work. So what do we do? All scripture is God-breathed and is useful to teach us what is right and wrong, and God uses it to equip all of his people for every good work. So, so Timothy, preach the word in season and out. right? Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. That's what the pastor does. That's the job of the pastor, whether it's me or someone else. If you walk into this church or any other, that's what that man needs to do. That's his job. Don't impose anything else on him. Don't make him do garbage. Don't make him do weddings. If he wants to, praise the Lord. That is his job is to feed you the word of God. That's the pastor's job. And then to shepherd, right? So the first thing is to, to feed you the truth so that you know, right? So when the people come in and it's not right, Right? You should sniff it out. Right? And then to shepherd. So first you feed, you give him the truth. And shepherd is, you, you've noticed as, a, as an elder, hey, this guy's a false teacher. He's a wolf. You point out the wolf. You call him out. Okay? I'm not saying anyone's a wolf. But listen, if it was him, no. Hey, this guy Jerome is a wolf. Don't listen to anything he has to say. He's wrong. That's what you do. I love you. That would never happen. But, but listen, you call him out. Right? Because if you let that, that wolf in the flock, eventually he's insidious, he's sneaky, he's conniving, he's going to sneak and worm his way in, and he's going to devour, right? So you point him out. That's what the shepherd's supposed to do. I love guys who are, you watch them on TV, they're just calling people out by name. Charlatan, right? You, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. There's no hiding it. Don't sugarcoat it. People's eternity is at stake. Right? What if they believe something that's false and they embrace it as truth and it's not the real gospel? What does Paul say about someone who, who preaches another gospel? Cursed. Cursed. If the person's cursed, what about the person who receives it as truth? Cursed. Right? Destined for, for hell. Not good. Not good. So the job of the pastor, the job of the elder, the overseer, is to feed the, word, the flock with the word of God, to shepherd them, to watch for the, watch for the wolf, warn the flock of its presence, and here's the thing, the, the warning isn't really about the, 
the, you see them online all the time, the whack job on YouTube, right? There's so many. Everyone's an apostle. Everyone's a prophet. Everyone, that, that, man, they, I've seen some stuff, right? Y'all have seen some stuff on YouTube, right? I'm not talking about those guys. I'm not talking about your cousin Johnny's best friend down in his basement in Cincinnati that knows what he's talking about. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. The warning is in verse 29 and 30. Look here. I know that false teachers like vicious wolves will come in among you after I leave, not sparing the flock. Even some men from your own group will rise up and distort the truth in order to draw a following. The attack is from within. Help me out, loved ones. When the cat's away, yeah, that's what happens. And Paul knew that, right? And so he's warning them. He knew this was going to happen. Jesus himself actually warned the same kind of a thing. In Matthew 24, verse 24, he said, False Christs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders. Right? Looks like Christianity. Remember the Pharaoh's guys? They had some snakes too, didn't they? They weren't the good snakes. They weren't the real snakes. They weren't the strong snakes. They were the fake snakes, the weak snakes. But they had snakes. They had some snakes, right? Powerful things, miracles. Crazy stuff. Jesus said false Christs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders. Listen, this is the scary part. So as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen, or in your scripture it might say, even God's elect. What is that? I mean, that's scary to me. To me, that's he's, like, I can understand how a false teacher could take someone who's not a Christian and give him some false garbage, and you'd be like, hey, that sounds Bible-y. I'll, I'll do that. Kind of sounds, kind of resembles something that my grandma used to say when I was a kid, so yes. But, but, but look at, he says, Jesus says, listen, they're going to try to even deceive his elect, the ones that are actually say, his people, the ones that he has chosen for salvation, the ones that said yes to him, that bent the knee to Christ, these people are going to come into your church and they're going to rise up from within the flock and they're going to try to deceive even the ones who are saved, God's church. That should scare you. That should scare you. It's a dis- it's a, it looks Christian, right? It sounds Christian, but it's not Christian at all. It's a distortion of the real thing, a falsified reproduction of the real thing. And so knowing that this invasion is coming, and this, and this, this is awesome, and it did. It did. If you read on into the book of Revelation chapter 2, when Jesus is talking to the church at Ephesus, he acknowledges that they took heed to Paul's warning in Acts chapter 20. Can I read that to you? Is that cool? Let me turn there. Revelation chapter 2. Ephesus. So he says, Jesus says, verse 2, I know all things that you do. I've seen your hard work and your patient endurance. Watch this. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You've discovered that they are liars. Paul says, it's coming. And guess what? It did. And it's going to come here. And it has come here in the past. And it will come here again. And if you get moved by the Holy Spirit to some church in name the city, it's going to happen there. The devil is alive and well, and he wants to ruin God's church. Right. But, but, but listen, God's given you a warning here today. Watch out! Watch out! Right? Pay attention, man. Get your eyes open. That's why the Bible says to be sober-minded. So you can see the ploys of the enemy. Right? Because they're slight. They're sneaky. They're conniving. They're attractive. You start preaching that, hey, listen, you'd be a Christian, you'd be rich. You can live forever. Right? That's enticing. Who doesn't want that Christianity? Everyone wants it because it's the American way. Life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, big house, lots of money. Woo! Start preaching that gospel. People start going, yeah, it's enticing. It's seductive, sneaky, slight, seductive, awful. You know what it is? It's sin. All that other stuff that's S, 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 right? So knowing the the invasion is coming... 
Here's how Paul would say we should fight so that we could win. Look here in Acts 20, verse 32. What does he say? And now, so he's leaving, right? He's gone. He paused on his way to Jerusalem to go to Pentecost, but he stops and he's talking to these people, and he's like, listen, I've left, but now I entrust you to God. Like, I'm not going to be there with you anymore. I entrust you to God and the message of his grace. So it's not just who God is, but what God has done, right? I entrust you to the, not only to the God who did it, but what he did. I entrust you to what he did. The message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. He wants you to always remember the message of God's grace. The gospel is the ultimate message of God's grace. That's right. I look at my beautiful wife back there. She's so teeny, I can't see her behind you. She's back there. There you go. That's God's grace to me. Like, I get it. Like, I don't, you know, grace is what you get what you don't deserve. Look at me, look at her. I get it. But the ultimate, like our kids, too, I love them. I love you guys. I love that we got to do this. All of that, right? But the ultimate message of God's grace is that you are and I am just horrific. We, d- we don't deserve to go to heaven and stand before a holy and perfect God. Who could, who could, who could ascend the mountain of the Lord, it says? Like, that's just the rhetorical. That, that's like no one can. Only those whose hearts are pure. Yeah, raise your hand if that's you. Pure evil. At least there's one honest guy in here. That's the message of God's grace. The gospel. The gospel, right? And, and, and why is it that the message of the gospel was all, that's all Paul preached. Remember when I came to you, he said, fear, trembling, what was my message? Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then he says it again, what's the message? You have to repent of your sin and turn to God and have faith in Christ. It was always the same thing, over and over and over again. They didn't come to church looking for some new heavenly revelation that the pastor dug out of scripture. Paul was really plain. You're a sinner. That's why Billy Graham was so effective. You're all sinners, and you're going to fall into the hands of an angry God. And if you don't repent of your sin and embrace what Christ did and who he is on that cross, you're going to hell. Now come. And they would just pour down. And here we are, week after week, trying to come up with something new to entertain the flock when all the while the message is simple. Repent of your sin and turn to Christ. That's what you need, right? And Paul's like, listen, as I leave... Listen, elders, preach the gospel every single week. I know everyone, do I know everybody in this room? Do, 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 do. I know everyone in this room, but I know, don't know you well enough to know if you're saved. Some of you, I've seen your fruit, and I know that you are. But some of you, I don't know well. Maybe you're not. Maybe you come to church, but you might not even be saved. So I'm telling you, you heard the gospel twice today. That's what you need to hear. If you want to do a class, look, at, on, on Thursday night, doing the study in the book of James. You want to come and learn how to control your tongue? Awesome. I probably should go to that. <laughs> but you can go to that. That's awesome. Supplemental. You know what you really need to hear? Yet again, the gospel. The gospel, the gospel, the gospel. The gospel of good news. The good news of Jesus Christ coming down from heaven to, to seek and save that which was lost and that was you. That's what you need to hear. And what does it do? Listen, that's why he says, I command, I, I'm entrusting you to God, not only to him, but to the message of his grace. The message that it says it right there. I'm not making anything up. It says that um, to build you up, right? The more you hear the gospel, the real gospel all the time, over and over and over and over and over again, nothing creative, nothing new. It's the gospel. You need to hear it. It's the truth. It builds you up and protects you from the false wolf that will come in. If, you're, if, you're, if the gospel has gripped your heart, you're going to know who's false. 
Right? Because the Holy Spirit is going to bury down deep into your heart and you're going to sniff it out when it comes in here, right? So that's what he says. I want you to, I want you to just, just to be entrusted to the message of God's grace, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It helps build you up and then it also instills hope. Look what it says there. It builds you up and it gives you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. It, it, every single time you hear the gospel, you're reassured of the fact that you've earned nothing for it, but he's given you this gift of grace so you can have heaven eternal. And one day he's going to cut the clouds and come back and bring you to be with him forever. In this new heaven, in this new earth, it's going to be awesome. No more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, no more tears. Everything is new. Streets of gold, awesome. Throwing your crowns down before Jesus, singing holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's your future. And when you hear the gospel, you're built up and strengthened and you're given additional hope, right? That's what you need. And so the commission here in the text is for the elders to feed the flock the truth. I hope I've been faithful to do that to you today and to protect the flock from the distortion of God's word. And then I just wouldn't be negligent to say before we close is this. This is definitely to the elders of the church. But please, loved ones, don't hear that that's their job and not yours. Okay? I'm a slacker, and so is he. And, and, and so you, as a blood-bought believer, follower of Jesus Christ, you need to study the Word of God continually, it says, and meditate on it daily so that you can parse between truth and false, right? N truth and lies. You need to be able to know. If I'm away one, what if I came in here, uh, I wasn't here one week, and I said, hey, John Abner, we would never do this, I love the guy. But I said, John, I need you to preach. And he got up there, and he's got a microphone on, right? And so when you get something, he's got a microphone, he's behind a pulpit, there's some sense of, of credibility and respect and honor for this right here and this right here. And you believe everything that they would say. You need to study the Word of God on your own so that you understand the difference between truth and lies. Because the lies of the devil are not blatant, hey, y'all, Jesus ain't real. That's never going to happen here. What's going to happen is someone at the pulpit, someone at a church you visit, something on YouTube, or whatever it is that you're doing, you're going to walk in, and they're going to be sneaky and sleight of hand, and they're going to tell you something that just goes this. Ready? Tweak. Tweak. Just a little tweak. And it's going to throw you off, and you're going to take that bait, and you're going to swallow it down like it's truth, and that is, that is, that's hell for you. Don't do that, right? So listen, loved ones. Study to show yourself approved. Study, okay? Study. Know God's word, all right? Know God's word. All right, loved ones. We're going to take a, a few moments here, and we're going to take communion. What in the world is that thing? I love you. <clears throat> you got it just in time. Let's take communion. I need two people to come up here. And we're going to pass out these communion trays. We're going to take communion together as a family. All right? And we're going to remember the Lord Jesus. Like, listen, get this stuff and hold on to it, and then we're going to take communion together as a family, okay? But while you're getting the stuff, we have a few minutes to kind of reflect, and you can bow your heads, and you can pray, and you can have some precious time alone with the Lord. I want you to remember the gospel. That's what I want to do today. I want you to remember the gospel. Above and beyond all things. Go ahead, hand it out, hand it out. Above and beyond all things. I want you to remember the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. 100% God, 100% man. He steps down off of his throne in heaven to seek and save you. I want you to think about that and all that it would mean for you in your life. Rejoice. Celebrate that.
just want to remind you afresh that you are Christ's church. Not purchased with money, not purchased with stuff, but purchased with his own blood. I want you to think about that. You're part of that church. Revolution Church is part of that church. At some point, that has to sink in. So you understand the importance of what this is and what you're called to be a part of. When the Holy Spirit comes and says, Moses and Herb, it's time to lay your hands on them and they need to go and start a new work for me. That's awesome. If you feel led of the Spirit to go somewhere, do it. But while you're here or then whatever you go, while you're there, understand that you're part of the church that was purchased with his blood. How could we thank you, Jesus? I'm often in this place, Lord, when we're taking communion and I understand that it's a cup and a piece of matzah and it just doesn't seem to, I don't know, it just doesn't seem to to be enough. It just doesn't seem enough. But it represents something. It represents who you are, what you've done for us. But I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it now, right now, fresh, that taking the communion is not the response you want. It's living a life that is worthy of that gospel. That's what you want. And I pray, God, that you will help every single person right now within the sound of my voice, whether it's here in this room or online. You'll help them to understand the value that they have in your eyes. And understand the the monumental, important mission that you've put us on to partner with you to seek and save that which is lost. every 12 seconds. Someone perishes. Heaven help us, Lord, to not let that happen on our watch. So, Lord, we take the bread and we take the cup now really to celebrate, to acknowledge the payment that you made and to celebrate this truth. What an incredible truth, right? What an incredible truth. Wicked sinners allowed into a perfect heaven in the presence of a holy God because of you, Jesus. So we take the bread now. Represent your body broken for us. Make it personal for me. The cup having special significance today as we've studied your word. Talking about your blood poured out to pay for this church to pay for us to save us, to put us together to call us to action that's what the cup is a sign of your amazing unwavering commitment to us we take the cup thank you Jesus 
Now, Lord, we transition to a time of giving. We pray, as we always do here at our church, that you would speak to each and every person here right now. and Speak to them about their partnership with you. You've called them here. This is where they're to serve. 